Let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we de dedicate our prayer this morning um, to our Blessed Mother and request for um, her aid uh, in accomplishing, in us accomplishing all of our daily tasks. It is becoming for you, O oh Mary, to be mindful of us as you stand near him with bestowed, which, who bestowed upon you all graces. For you are the mother of God and our queen. Come to our aid for the sake of the king, the Lord God and master, who was born of you. For this reason, you are called full of grace. Be mindful of us, most holy virgin, and bestow on us gifts from the riches of your graces, O virgin, full of grace. And this we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to uh, talk about uh, the key people of the Renaissance. Um, some good ones to talk about and some not so good. Uh, but nevertheless, it's history. Uh, these are the uh, popes and monarchs of the era of the Renaissance and their effects on the church and its people. Yikes. I thought we'd start with uh, looking at the uh, uh, city of Florence. Uh, the city of Florence was sort of the, uh, the, the key uh, to the Renaissance. And uh, if we take a look at the political life in Florence, we sort of get an idea of what was going on. Um, it's important to do this because during the Renaissance, Florence was the most important cultural center in Europe. Its history, the history of Florence, was uh, dominated by the Medici family. Uh, Cosimo de' Medici was its most important family member, its most prominent family member. He was a... Uh, pretty skilled politician who ended wars that plagued Florence for a century and he was recognized for that. He was a very devout Catholic with a close relationship to Franciscans and Dominicans. During this time religion and Renaissance Florence fluctuated between coldness and fervor. Um, Florentines loved their wealth and their splendor, but once in a while they would um, turn to live as good Catholics. That only happened once in a while. Um, does, does that sound familiar? The, uh, the, the picture that you see here is a uh, uh, a sketch or a painting of the city of Florence um, during the Renaissance. From 1494 to 1497, there was a resurgence of faith and the Medicis were forced out of power. 
there was a um, Dominican uh, friar, very conservative, by the name of Savonarola, that drove the family from Florence, and um, uh, he did that in order to uh, uh, morally reform uh, the populace in uh, Florence. Now, it lasted for uh, three years, and then the Florentines sort of got tired of the whole thing. And um, uh, although they originally supported uh, the uh, uh, Dominican friar, uh, Savonarola, eventually they grew tired uh, of the reforms. And uh, they went back to their splendor and wealth and um, enjoying their times. Um, Savonarola was hanged, and the uh, Medicis uh, were returned to power. So much for their good Catholic conscience. Now, at the time, when all of this was going on, part of the new order uh, in Florence and in the major cities of the Renaissance, uh, one of the things that was changing was merchant banking. The increase in merchant activity during the Renaissance gave rise to various banking systems to deal with uh, credit financers and other issues in the merchant community. Um, some merchants began to uh, lend money. Uh, now, this was something that uh, only banks were supposed to do, but now the merchants were doing it. And uh, you can imagine, they were lending money much easier than banks, but at a much higher interest rate. And uh, now you know when it started. Um, merchant banking was mostly Italian, uh, mostly an Italian business. And the family uh, whose name was synonymous with banking was, uh, you guessed it, Medici. However, it wasn't just the Italians that did it. It was uh, closely followed by the Germans, the English, and the Spanish who picked up the business of banking. Uh, there was a German family uh, called the Fuggers that uh, created a banking empire using their wealth from uh, mining uh, uh, and trading of silver, copper, and mercury. Bankers were uh, able to transfer money to distant places and thereby establishing the international exchange market. And the uh, uh, picture that you see here is sort of a, a typical picture of a bank in those times uh, with uh, uh, deals getting uh, recorded in uh, books and uh, money all over the place. So with that, as a background, you know, a lot of money flowing around, a lot of art flowing around. Um, what was really happening uh, in the church uh, within this uh, Renaissance culture? Um, so the first thing to do is to take a look at the Renaissance popes. As you'll see, the Renaissance popes lived more like worldly princes than men called to reflect the, holinesses, the holiness of Christ's vicar. Uh, they acted more, again, as princes wanting to increase their power. The Renaissance church was in need of strong leadership because one, the political infighting among European Christian states had weakened Europe in its fight against the Turks. 
no matter what the Pope, as you'll see, no matter who the Pope was, uh, they tried um, to uh, get the states awakened to the fact that the Turks were gaining and gaining fast. And they didn't care. They were too occupied fighting each other. Number two, the church faced political turmoil as member states vied for temporal sovereignty. Just as I said, they were fighting each other. Uh, they didn't care about the Turks. They cared about fighting each other and taking each other's property. Um, and that was, that was it. Many of the popes, uh, despite uh, the human limitations, and you'll be able to see those, were able to show that the Holy Spirit was still directing Christ's church. And those popes, uh, the Renaissance, were uh, Nicholas V, Callistus III, Pius II, Sixtus IV, who is uh, shown here in the uh, picture, Innocent VIII, Alexander VI, and Julius II. And we're going to get to talk a little bit about each of those. The Renaissance uh, was really a time of intellectual growth and artistic development in the church, but also a time of tremendous, tremendous turmoil. So let's start with uh, the first one, Nicholas V, who reigned as Pope from 1447 through 1455. He was the first of the Renaissance popes. Pope Nicholas V, who is shown in the, uh, in the picture that you see here, the painting, was uh, really uh, the greatest of the Renaissance popes. And uh, as you, you'll see the others, uh, it, it was easy to be the best in that bunch. Um, his familiarity with scholastic philosophy and the church fathers made him prominent during discussions between the Catholic Church and uh, the Greek Orthodox bishops uh, during reconciliation talks. So he was viewed as a very important person, a very learned person, but he had no luck. Uh, he couldn't bring him together, uh, even though he tried. He undertook three major tasks. One was to make Rome the city of grand monuments. Two was to make Rome the center of architecture. And three, to strengthen spiritually and temporally the capital of Christendom. So he was really focused internally on Rome. He restored churches, he repaired the Roman infrastructure, he cleaned the city, and he repaired the ancient aqueducts. Um, he laid the foundation for St. Peter's Basilica, and uh, he was responsible for founding the Vatican, the Vatican Library. So overall, he did a lot of good work. He did strengthen the papacy and won the submission of anti-pope Felix V. If you remember uh, two uh, classes ago, uh, we talked about the anti-popes. The anti-popes recited in Paris. Uh, and uh, they sort of... Uh, uh, would duke it out with the Pope in Rome. Um, so that was uh, uh, Felix V and uh, uh, Nicholas won the submission of anti-Pope Felix V. He tried to uh, achieve political unity in Europe, but he failed, uh, he failed miserably in trying to uh, uh, save Constantinople from the Turks. He was successful in integrating the 
new learning structure, the new learning philosophy of the Renaissance uh, with the Catholic faith. After Nicholas V, then came three popes, Callistus III, uh, who is shown here in the, uh, in the uh, painting, uh, who reigned 1455 through 1458, Pius II from 1458 through 1464, and finally Sixtus IV, 1471 through 1484. Um, notice that none of them really lasted uh, a tremendous amount of time. Um, the Spanish-born Alfonso Borgia became Pope Callistus III in 1455. And like I said, Callistus is shown here uh, in the picture. Um, his energies were focused upon uh, uh, stemming the uh, Turkish threat. Um, however, he encountered the same problems as the others, disunity, uh, within the Christian states uh, put uh, Christendom at a disadvantage uh, for achieving victory. Uh, really no chance of victory with the tremendous disunity. He oversaw the reversal of the sentence against St. Joan of Arc and he proclaimed her innocence uh, and he did continue the fight against the Turks. Um, however, the way that he tried to achieve unity was uh, a little misplaced. Uh, what he did was to try and hire uh, all his relatives and friends as part of the administration in Rome. Uh, that uh, didn't work. Then came Pope Pius II, whose uh, youth was marked uh, uh, by moral laxity and he embraced the humanist movement. Now this was not totally a bad movement, uh, but it, it, uh, it, it sort of degraded at times into um, badness, if you want to call it that way, because it proclaimed self-sufficiency. And that self-sufficiency was in many cases taken to the limit. In other words, uh, all I need is me I don't need God for anything. In his youth, Pius II um, uh, took on that humanist uh, attitude. His acceptance of uh, the pagan culture uh, in his early days led him to indulge in many worldly pursuits, including serving as secretary of the anti-pope uh, Felix V. However, he did reconcile with Pope Eugene IV, his predecessor, and, and then underwent uh, a strong spiritual conversion. Um, he was uh, the one who canonized uh, St. Catherine of Siena. Then came Pope Sixtus VI, who was originally a very virtuous Franciscan monk and a professor of philosophy in several Italian universities. Good news for him, he was a very strong follower of St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Sixtus took steps to suppress the abuses uh, in the Inquisition, and he fought hard against heresy. Um, he was credited for building the Sistine Chapel. The last three popes of the Renaissance um, were, uh, were doozies. Um, they were Innocent VIII, Alexander VI, and Julius II. Uh, the end of the 15th and the beginning of the 16th centuries brought the church three popes, those three that I mentioned, 
who showed very poor moral leadership and uh, worldly attitudes unfit uh, for the vicar of Christ. Innocent VIII rose to the papacy in 1484, and he proceeded to focus on the rise of Islam, like many of his predecessors. But like his predecessors, um, he had no luck. He was unsuccessful in trying to unify Europe and failed to take any significant action. Uh, while he was pope, um, not because of him, but uh, the times, uh, the Moors and the Jews were expelled from Spain in 1492 uh, during a period that was called the Reconquista, uh, the Reconquest. Uh, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, Innocent VIII was followed by the most notorious Renaissance pope, and that was Alexander VI, whose ambition was to unify Italy. He was a gifted leader and administrator, but he had moral shortcomings and a lot of religious insincerity. Um, he fathered nine illegitimate children, thereby tarnishing the moral authority of the church. He did negotiate uh, the treaty between Spain and Portugal and was responsible for uh, sending missionaries to the New World. This is the picture of Alexander IV that uh, you see here. He was followed by Julius II. Um, and uh, Julius had been uh, Alexander's rival in the College of Cardinals. Julius was the sponsor of uh, great works, great works of art, um, uh, including those of Michelangelo and Raphael. Uh, as you can see, uh, to put it kindly, uh, these were not great popes, uh, but they did upheld the teachings of the church, even though they were not great at practicing them. After you see all of these seven popes, perhaps Nicholas V, the exception, you can sort of get a feel for why it was that the times were ripe for Martin Luther and the people that backed him uh, in the Reformation. And by the way, we're going to talk about the Reformation next week. Now, in addition to the popes uh, we have talked about, during the Renaissance, uh, a different type of monarch rose to lay down the foundations for the modern state. Uh, they expanded their domains and instituted more efficient forms of government. One of those rulers uh, is shown here in the picture, uh, Henry Tudor, who rose to be Henry VII. Um, the new rulers tried new policies to encourage trade and economic growth in order to expand the royal treasuries and increase their power. The more money, generally, the more power. Kings of the time, of course, continued to tax subjects and have ready access to a source of income. Uh, the maintenance and support of local no nobles was uh, almost universally uh, declared illegal, uh, thereby uh, consolidating power at the king's level. That means... Um, 
that uh, bureaucratic administration and the diminished power of the aristocracy led to an increased central authority. These new refocused states would dominate the start of a new modern era. So now let's take a look at some of these monarchs and start with France and England. King Louis XI, who reigned from 1461 through 1483, and shown here uh, in the picture, uh, quite as nos, um, um, he emerged as the uh, uh, new monarch in France at a very critical time. Uh, he was the one that orchestrated France's defeat of the English in the 100 Years' War, uh, and so therefore became uh, very loved in France. And he took advantage of that, of the surge in national spirit and the love for him, uh, to create a perpetual tax, the tally, uh, to remove, and, and he removed restrictions uh, on his power. Uh, so, of course, he used the situation for his advantage. Louis also created a professional army to suppress brigands and to deal with the rebellious um, nobles whose power was being uh, taken away from them. Across the Channel, England had its own civil war uh, called the War of the Roses uh, after the end of of 100 year war. So after 100 year war with France, they went into 30 years of civil war. And finally, the Tudors, uh, the Tudor family, proved victorious, and Henry Tudor became Henry VII. Um, Henry was uh, overall a good guy, uh, expanded the trade, he encouraged private enterprise. He ended the practice of support of local nobles, uh, which was the trend, and he consolidated his kingdom. Um, but his most shrewd move was asking, uh, uh, what was uh, his most shrewd move as king was offering his son, the future Henry VIII, uh, in marriage to Catherine of Aragon of Spain. Over time, England behind the Tudors would become the foremost power in Europe. Arguably, however, the best for uh, the people was um, what was going on in Spain and Queen Isabella the Catholic Queen. At the beginning of the 15th century, uh, Spain as a nation did not exist. It was comprised of five kingdoms with various languages and customs for its Christian, Muslim, and Jewish population. So it was a varied population, different customs, and uh, tough to get together. Because of this diversity, unification was unlikely, but the Catholic Church provided the means for uniting the country. The marriage of Isabella of Castile and the King of Aragon, Ferdinand, provided the political unity. Marriage paved the way for the Reconquista, that was the reconquest, the reconquest of all of the Spanish land uh, for Christianity over the Moors or Muslims. Um, the Reconquista drove out uh, the Moors, uniting the country over a Christian rule. And as a result, Spain became the most powerful country in Europe for the next 150 years. Queen Isabella, who is shown here in the, uh, in the picture, was devoutly Catholic 
and her efforts would strengthen the church of, in Spain, thereby avoiding uh, the problems of the Reformation in her country. She loved a life of prayer and simplicity. Uh, she prohibited African slavery, and she was responsible for sending missionaries to Africa uh, for the conversion of the citizenry. She was very dedicated to helping the poor. In 1492, as most of you remember, Isabella sponsored Christopher Columbus uh, on a mission to find a water route to India. Uh, you all know the result. Uh, Columbus stumbled uh, into the American continent and he opened the door to European expansion into the New World. What was important about Isabella is that she took personal charge of her kingdom. She traveled with her husband Ferdinand during the Reconquista, bringing medical care to the wounded and administering justice in the field. She absolutely opposed the excesses of war and punished by hanging any soldier who raped or plundered. She believed and showed that the main force of unity in Spain was the Catholic faith. Under the principle of unity of faith, Queen Isabella felt compelled to expel Muslims and Jews who would not convert to the Catholic faith. She was the one who instituted the Spanish Inquisition to ensure true conversion among Muslims and Jews. Historians credit the Reconquista with avoiding, avoiding the wars of religion uh, that ravaged Europe in the 16th century. However, it is also believed that driving the Muslims and Jews that did not convert out of Spain um, caused or aided uh, Spain's eventual economic decline. Uh, the picture you see here is a picture, a painting of the surrender of the Moors at uh, Granada, Spain. A big helper of uh, Isabella during her campaign of uniting the people of Spain was Cardinal Jimenez de Cisneros. Uh, he was born Gonzalo Jimenez de Cisneros, uh, and that's a picture of him uh, here. A painting of him. Um, and he was named cardinal during the political turmoil of the uh, late 15th century. So he was there at the same time as Isabella. Um, he had originally joined the Franciscan order and um, he was looking to sort of leave the world, be a monk, be by himself and pray, devote his life to simplicity and prayer. Um, as usual, the Lord had different ideas for him. Um, however, during this time, his uh, reputation as a confessor spread throughout of the whole of Spain. And Queen Isabella called him to be her own personal confessor. Uh, she, in fact, was so pleased with him that she appointed him Bishop of Toledo. As Bishop of Toledo, he helped Spain become the only European country to undergo a major reform. He was credited with building the University of Alcala and introduced the first humanist school in Spain. And after Isabella's death, he honored her commands to protect African slaves and Native Americans. The efforts of Queen Isabella and Cardinal Cisneros were essential in defending the church 
against the rising Protestant tide. They actually prepare the way for the Catholic reforms of the 16th century. One more country, and that was Germany, the last important country in Europe at the time. In Germany, the Habsburgs were taking over. Uh, 15th century Germany uh, was actually a confederation of 89 cities, 89, much worse than the case in Spain. Uh, it was very difficult to govern in any unified form. Uh, in 1452, King Frederick III of Austria, the House of Habsburg, uh, rose to effectively unite and govern the confederation of 89 cities. The Habsburgs uh, thus dominated the empire from 1452 to 1806. The greatest of these Habsburg emperors was the grandson of Isabella, Charles V, who is shown here in uh, the painting. Um, what he did is he united four grandparents' inheritance ruling Austria, the Netherlands, Castile, Spanish America, and Aragon's uh, Mediterranean and Italian possessions. It became the largest conglomeration of territories since Charlemagne. For his part, Charles V championed the Catholic cause in Europe against the Turkish invaders and became the most powerful rule in the continent. However, the continuing Muslim threat and the explosive actions of Martin Luther gave rise to great conflicts in the 16th century. The two biggest, the Protestant Reformation and the Peasant Wars. So that sets you up for next week talk about the Reformation. In conclusion, at its best, the Renaissance provided for the rise of Christian humanism, the rebirth of classical principles, and a magnificent growth in the fine arts. However, its excesses exaggerated the understanding of human capacity and encouraged a false sense of self-sufficiency. Again, no God needed here. Um, sort of uh, familiar, right? The contradictions of the Renaissance era were um, indeed exemplified by the lives of the popes of that period. Uh, their artistic and intellectual heritage survives to this day. That was great. However, the um, great and gro gross excesses uh, and the tremendous immorality, not immortality, that's a misspelling, tremendous immorality attached to these men uh, was extremely reprehensible. Uh, the picture you see here, by the way, is part of the art of that period. That's uh, Michelangelo's Pietà. The Renaissance popes represent an ironic reality. Often in history, less than worthy men have been chosen to carry and sustain the mystical body of Christ. The good news, however, is that with all that, the promise of Jesus to preserve his church forever still stands. Amen. Three questions. The first one is, the Renaissance was an age of elitism, where self-sufficiency meaning the no need for God, was proclaimed. Do you see a parallel in today's world? I'm sure you don't. Um, number two, Queen Isabella drove professed Jews and Muslims out of Spain in order to unify the country through faith. 
Do you see a difference between that or a peril between that and today's Islamic State? How do you compare the Renaissance popes with today's popes, like John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and Francis? And the picture you see here, by the way, is the picture of uh, Cardinal Cisneros uh, freeing the last Christians uh, from the Moors in the Reconquista. Next week, uh, like I said, uh, the Reformation and uh, the Protestant Revolt. Thank you very much and God bless you. Oh,